Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us today. You are joining the virtual cards in the area in the era of digital banking and payments, uh, an open banking webinar hosted by the Canadian Prepaid Providers Organization and FSS Payments. I'm Jennifer Tremontana. I am proud to be the executive director of the CPPO, and I'm going to be moderating our exceptional panel of experts today. So what are we going to talk about in the next hour we have together? Uh, it's no secret that 2020 brought on a slew of challenges for all of us, but it's the beginning of 2021. So let's kind of put that in the rear view mirror for now and talk about the opportunities that the payments industry has ahead of us. Um, of which there are many. And in fact, one of the possibly biggest challenges that the payments uh, community is gonna have in 2021 is really deciphering where to turn next and where to put resources with respect to all of the opportunities um, that are gonna be available to us. So what to prioritize. Um, one place that we know that's gonna accelerate dramatically uh, this year is going to be in card issuing. So we're gonna focus our discussion on the opportunities uh, for prepaid and card issuing in 2021 with our panel of experts that we have assembled here today. And I'd love to introduce them to you. Uh, first is Jose Gutierrez from MasterCard. He is the Director of Digital Payments and Labs at MasterCard, where he's responsible for deployment and delivery of tokenization solutions, wallets, and e-commerce, all for MasterCard Canada. Uh, next is Jayesh Sawant, who is with FSS, our co-host today. Um, he's the head of the payments practice and innovation at FSS, focused on alignment of business strategy to increase digital footprints, revenue, and technology. Uh, next up, Brendan Carley. Brendan is here with Payments Canada. He is the Director of Regulatory Affairs. So he leads efforts uh, to ensure regulatory, um, act to engage regulatory actors with the Payments Canada Modernization Program, which you're all familiar with. So his team is really uh, responsible for regular oversight and approval uh, processes with Bank of Canada. He works with the rest of the public sector, Department of Finance, influencing public policy, et cetera. Um, so we're glad to have him with us today. Um, and next is Elizabeth Lett, who is a managing partner with Holt Accelerator. Um, Holt is uh, Canada's most active seed fintech investor. Over the last two years, Holt has received over 1,800 applicants for a spot in their program from over 85 countries. She invests in the top 1% of applicants globally, and they've currently got a portfolio of more than 28 active investments and have raised an additional 30 million uh, post program, which is up from 12 million prior to entering the program. So huge growth there. And last but not least, Jeremy Nichols, um, who is with Everlink. He's the general manager of card services and fraud solutions. Um, he joined Everlink in April of 2020, and he's responsible for the operational oversight of Everlink's cards and fraud lines of business. And uh, his background is in, uh, is in fraud with 32 years of experience in managing fraud, having spent 20 years in the British police and nine years as a detective investigating serious fraud offenses. So I'm sure we'll have some interesting questions for Jeremy today. So thank you so much for our panelists joining us today. Um, these are true experts and um, they are gonna give you some great information today. However, we do want this to be an interactive discussion. So in the Q&A portion um, of your screen, which is in the bottom center, you can send us questions throughout the entire um, hour that we have together. Uh, if it makes sense to um, have a question answer that's sort of part of the flow of discussion, I'll be watching it the whole time. I will um, grab your question and, and answer, have the group answer, or we will certainly save about 10 minutes at the end for additional questions if you want to save them to then or, or pop them into the chat and we'll make sure that, or sorry, not the chat, into the Q&A function and make sure that we answer them at the end. Uh, that is important. The chat function has been disabled. So it should be on your screen, but know that if you put anything through the Q&A, it will come to us and we will have it uh, answered. Um, so with all that housekeeping out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So my first question, just to kind of set the stage for what we're talking about here today is, 
we now have the data um, and we know that um, COVID-19 has impacted consumer payment preferences and behaviors in Canada. So let's get really clear and specific about what has changed and what we see continuing to change in the next 18 months. And Jose, I'd love to start and throw this question to you. Uh, your vantage point at MasterCard, I think will give us the best uh, sort of jumping off point for this. Yeah, so I think it's interesting when, when we think about how COVID-19 has impacted payments in Canada, it's not that it's introduced any new trends or pain points, it's rather accelerated trends that we already saw in the market uh, in many instances by a number of years. I think the, the two that come to mind uh, are e-commerce and what we've seen Canadians and how they've seen them flock towards e-commerce as well as contactless payments. Uh, to give the group a little bit more context, in Canada on a normal week uh, prior to the pandemic, which feels like a long, long time ago, typically around 70% of our transactions were being done in brick and mortar channels with the other 30% being e-com. At the height of the lockdowns in summer in Canada, we had many, many weeks where we passed the 50% point. So about a 20% shift towards e-commerce in Canada. Seems to make a lot of sense as so many of us had to uh, shift our purchases online, oftentimes for the first time. We also saw Canadians have more card on file relationships with merchants than ever before. We saw Canadians also try categories like grocery delivery uh, and, and food ordering that we had never seen uh, uh, before. And that kind of went down a little bit once the lockdowns were, were lifted, but we've seen it continue to, to oscillate at levels that we hadn't seen before. Um, and that is something, again, we had seen this trend before previous to COVID, e-commerce was growing around three times the rate of brick and mortar, uh, but this certainly accelerated by four to five years, depending on, on which data analysis uh, you look at. And then on the other hand, contactless payments. So while so much of our spend went towards e-commerce channels, there was still a very significant spend, about 50% that we continue to do in brick and mortar channels. Um, and if, for those of you that live in Canada watching this today, you probably already know Canada was a ubiquitous contactless market. Um, we're so used to tapping our cards, our mobile wallets to make payments. But even so, in a, in a market like ours where it was so uh, prevalent, we continue to see a very massive shift uh, of the brick and mortar volume previous, prior to COVID uh, that we would see in Canada. About 60% would be tapping of cards and phones. Uh, that new normal is now about 75%. Uh, that would have taken us about three years at normal run rates to get to 75% of brick and mortar transactions done uh, through those channels. And, and there's a lot more, but really what I'd highlight is that these were trends that were happening. Canadians were already going contactless. Canadians were already going to, towards e-commerce, um, but we've certainly seen this accelerate anywhere from three to five years uh, in terms of the pace of pickup. That's, that's phenomenal. So maybe not quite the uh, you know, we've all heard 10 years of digital transformation in 10 months, maybe it's more like three to four years, but still incredibly significant. Yeah. Uh, Brandon, does that jive with your viewpoint at Payments Canada and the data you're seeing? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. And I agree, uh, Jose, I think, um, you know, it's, uh, if you look at how things have shifted in the last six months to a year, we really have seen seen big, big shifts. There, there have been some pretty consistent trends up until 2019, uh, including you know, pretty healthy growth with, with prepaid cards at the point of sale, uh, about 8% in, in volume, 6% in value. And I should have a bit of a caveat here. Our, our research numbers look at both closed loop and open loop uh, together. But having said that, we do know about 80% of prepaid purchases at point of sale, both virtual and, and in person are closed loop in Canada, at least from, from our data. Uh, and so it's still a, a significant uh, part of it. And so, but obviously, you know, there's, there's a, been an increasing shift uh, to mobile and virtual cards uh, up until 2019. But what's been really interesting since the crisis is obviously, like not surprisingly, 50% of Canadians are saying they're using less cash. A third have increased their credit card usage and about a, a quarter to one in five are using debit cards more and uh, interact e-transfer, so online uh, account-based transfers. But when you get to the prepaid space, only 5% are saying that they're, they're uh, using prepaid more and a full third have said that they're actually using it a bit less. And uh, we, uh, it's, we haven't had a chance yet to really dig into it, but you know, a lot of that, that, uh, that trend I think we've seen driven by, by Canadians uh, over the age of 55 
and and we're wondering too if it has to do with that that less uh, uh, less people going to the store and and doing more stuff online. But it's uh, we're hopefully we'll have a little more analysis around this uh, into the new year. But it's it's definitely as as Jose has said, it's this has been a seismic shift in terms of how payments are done uh, in Canada and around the world. Yeah, we've, we've seen some other data from like Mercator Advisory Group and others who do a lot of work in prepaid that are showing the same thing that there's going to be a dip. Some of it has to do with, um, as you said, point of sale transactions, travel cards, you know, there's some other things that just took a big hit that prepaid has a big um, backing in. Um, but all um, forecasts are showing a, a, a bounce back already in 2021. Um, but let's talk about B2B for a second. So, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about consumer preferences and how those have changed. But um, Visa has a recent uh, business back to business study that was done of small uh, small businesses and 82% of them are di shifting more to digital payments. And of that, 30% are digitizing their back end operations, which they hadn't done to this point. Um, Elizabeth, I'm curious kind of your thoughts from your vantage points about B2B payments and what you see in terms of um, up an upcoming change or shift for those payments. Thank you. Um, I really, there's two kind of uh, prevalent elements, and there's one uh, quote that I continue to use. You know, I'm more than all of the healthcare systems worldwide, and you know, absolutely, you know, I applaud them. But our survival during COVID-19 has been driven by the underbelly of financial payments, um, where I believe, you know, from a North American side, we are much farther behind than other parts of the world. I think that uh, COVID-19 has ripped a Band-Aid off for us, which has been phenomenal. And I think, you know, I certainly agree with the accelerated uh, transition um, where the element that the other component seeing is so many businesses were significantly affected by COVID in terms of slowdown that they are now you know, actively looking for ways to cut operational expense. And a key one is certainly in the payments area on becoming far more effective on uh, ability to collect funds faster you know, where I look one in four in that study that you mentioned are transitioning to electronic invoicing. I was surprised like two personal references. So, you know, I had a roof done um, you know, beginning of uh, December. And for the first time, you know, I mean, this was an over 20K bill, they accepted it on Visa where that would have been unheard of months ago. Um, you know, what they talked about in the sense that, you know, they're willing to give up the percentage uh, on the cost of uh, Visa in order to save the cash flow element of that money moving so much faster into their systems. I, you know, even in terms of my, my dentist, which I was surprised, uh, you know, normally would have been transferred directly to the insurance, said, no, we want to be paid now. You can wait the 30 days to be paid by your insurance. Um, you know, they took Visa right on the spot, whereas before, you know, at, at best, they would have taken a check or interact. So, you know, these are critical elements affecting, and I think it's, it's motivation. A lot of people being much better educated inside their own lives of how they're conducting digitally can now apply those elements to their business. So I think those are you know, really fundamental changes that we're seeing on the business side. Definitely. I'm gonna um, answer live a quick question we have here before we move on. So the question's about gift cards um, and um, you know, Richard is asking that you know, gift cards he would assume would have, would have um, accelerated than before the pandemic. Um, I can answer a bit of this, Brendan. I'm not sure if you have anything else really to add because I think you were saying in your, you know, that yours is melded together. The, you know, all the data, it's gift, it's open loop, it's closed loop. So um, that's something that I know we're going to talk about and work on over time. But um, in terms of gift cards, I can tell, I can tell you, Richard, that in North America we did see an acceleration of e-gift gift cards, um, virtual or even physical, being sent through the mail, which makes a lot of sense. The physical retail gift cards, the ones that you can buy, you know, off the J hook at a grocery store or your favorite retailer, either open loop or closed loop, that's a mixed bag for a whole bunch of reasons, right? Some retailers have been shut down, others have been open. We've then had the lock, you know, we've had the lockdowns. Have they been included as essential goods? Have they not? It's been different in different provinces. So again, this is just kind of like a, a mix all over the place. And I don't think we've quite figured out, you know, all of the data from that. But in general, e-gift definitely up. Um, traditional, you know, more uh, retail focused gift cards, if you're buying them there, we're not exactly sure where we're going to, you know, where that has ended up at this point. Um, yeah, Jennifer, maybe, may just yeah. add, that, yeah, we don't have um, as much high frequency data around that, but in terms of, you know, what we're seeing uh, from other sources, I think, um, you know, over half of people 
uh, have reported purchasing or receiving a gift card in the holiday season. Yeah. Uh, in 2020, I think millennials are, are, are showing a significant amount of interest in this space. And, and you know, even if you look at, at how people are, are um, choosing to do year end gifts and, and things in a virtual environment, like that's a, it's a awesome use case for, for, uh, for the gift card, whether it's uh, especially the, um, the virtual issuance. Yeah. yeah. Well, that goes in nicely to my next question that I'd love to throw to you, Jayash. Um, you know, corporate corporates that are opting for virtual issu issuance, what do you think are some of the new use cases that might emerge and what strategies are there to get uh, more adoption here to bring small and medium businesses on 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 uh, on board? Yeah, I think I think uh, one can take away the fact uh, that the world has gone through crisis uh, set in motion by pandemic. Uh, but I do believe that the prepaid market continues to remain uh, vibrant and dynamic. Uh, so from a corporate perspective and issuer perspective, I think there are uh, a lot of opportunities out there where uh, which can help us to transition into virtual card. I think the, the transition is still in progress and that won't happen until the identity management or the privacy management and the security aspect is addressed. Uh, as far as use cases are concerned, I think, I think there are some interesting use cases out there uh, that would be driven by the digital adoption, uh, especially for student card, uh, government disbursement card or government subsidiary card, which is already launched in the US. Uh, interesting use case continues to emerge also in the insurance sectors now where uh, you can get a prepaid card for the accidental damage that we have from insurances. Uh, travel cards with multi-currency onto it, which is another interesting use case that we see. Uh, one of the other areas where I see uh, there could be a potential uh, is also restaurant industry with payroll card or a wage subsidiary card that can be given. Uh, so I think that's where I think the trend is shifting towards from, from a use case perspective to generate different flavors of this card. Uh, which can add value to the ecosystem in prepaid. Thank you. Jeremy, are you seeing anything um, to add to that on your end? Yeah, I think, um, and, and thank you, Jennifer. I think, you know, uh, to Jayesh's point, we've seen, we've seen a real shift in uh, what's happened with COVID. And as a result of that, as we're going to push forward, I think um, some digital versions of traditional analog products are going to, have to be generated uh, digital enhancements for existing products and and likely some entirely new digital offering, offerings as well. And I think I think when we look at um, at, at corporates, I, I think virt virtual is going to be moving into that accounts payable processing and maybe even accounts receivable processing too to create you know this this really robust platform, an easy platform that that takes away some of the the the, the paper use and and the the confusing and difficult challenges that accounts people people have in this space. I think that that virtual piece there fits really well into that. That makes sense. We've we've got a question here, and I'll see if you guys can can answer this. So, um, this is from. Um, uh, some, someone working at Banking Solutions at Indonesia Re Regional Bank, and I'll just read it out. Nowadays in India, it's more popular to use virtual accounts for e-commerce or other bill payments. Um, what makes virtual cards more popular in Canada recently, and what is the differences? And bill payment is certainly something we're seeing more of. So, Jayesh, I don't know if you can, you know, specifically answer this, you know, Canada versus Asia, but um, yeah. maybe you can talk a little bit about what, what makes virtual popular the bill payment case study, and if you have any um, any comparisons to Asia, I think I think virtual card issuance uh, streamlines the process of friction, right? I mean, uh, if you look at it, the customer onboarding is simple, uh, secure, easy. Uh, uh, it also reduces the fees that that are associated with issuing processes. So I think that's what makes it uh, very popular. The card is instantly loaded onto your phone, uh, and you can basically use it on your device. So I think that's what makes it very popular. Uh, from a virtual is issuance perspective uh, and from a bill payment perspective, comparing India to Canada, I think I think India is way ahead in, in terms of real-time payments, in terms of open banking. The framework is already laid out there with a lot of real-time channels that has been established. Uh, Canada is soon adopting to that. Uh, you know, we know Interact's coming up with their own real-time payments. We know Payments Canada is getting towards it soon. Uh, and that will definitely open up a, a lot of avenues for the fintechs to kind of uh, you know, yeah, capitalize on the open banking framework to talk to different fintechs and to enable bill payment ecosystems quite efficiently. Uh, and that would also drive the growth of prepaid or or, or an issuance, a virtual issuance platform uh, where people people can subscribe to, you know, a prepaid card that can be utilized for uh, bill payments as well. 
That makes sense. Uh, we're getting some, this kind of goes into our next question, but we're also getting some questions in the chat here that um, that relate to this. So, um, and I'm gonna stick with you, Jayesh and Jeremy, just for a second here, because as our kind of core issuer operators, I think these, these are best answered at least first by you guys, but then I'd love to bring in Elizabeth's perspective as well, because she, you know, as a core investor, I'm sure is seeing this in part of her portfolio. Um, so we know that virtual uh, cards through APIs have really taken hold. This is not a new area um, by any means and has been certainly growing in popularity over the last years and years. So um, walk us through what you think, and I know we've touched on a couple, but any of the other sort of opportunities post pandemic we see for prepaid card issuing. And then also um, we're being asked about, you know, what are the challenges and how do we incorporate that digital first experience? So um, I don't know if Jeremy, you wanna maybe start there, but I'd love to get both Jeremy and Jayesh uh, perspectives. I think I think um, you know what what what's really shown in um, in, in through COVID is is the need for social inclusion. Uh, so I think there's been a real need to be able to to um, get payment cards into the hands of underbanked or unbanked people who who should have the chance to be part of this digital economy. Too, and, and likely because of their own reasons, haven't been able to obtain credit cards. The, the debit card products here in Canada have, have been somewhat limited and uh, not, not have the ability in many aspects to do e-commerce transactions. So the prepaid card has really come into its own in relation to that. And I think, I think that's been a, a tremendous uptake and we'll continue to see it. But some, some other things as we come out of, out of COVID, I think um, you know, it's, it's right now is a real innovation driver for fintechs to come on board challenger banks i think we'll see uh, see more of those coming on board um we've seen the government benefits aspect of prepaid cards i think that's going to continue too and i think we'll see many more benefits being paid out through a through a prepaid product some social welfare or or disability channel to remove that paper aspect that checks as or that we've seen uh, over the past few years um, corporate expenses is another one that's, that, that I think we will see moving into into the prepaid space. It's it's better to control expenses, um, reduces the likelihood of overspends, uh, and likely is a cheaper process as well. And then other other aspects that I think um, student cards, children, teenagers, you know, children and teenagers especially. I think there's a real issue here in Canada with financial literacy, and I think a prepaid card can be used to great advantage there, where where it introduces them to a payment card in a really risk-free environment. Uh, and, and the same with students, you know, I mean, the people that have been students out there, they, they generate debt quite rapidly. And I think to, to issue a credit card to a student is, is quite challenging. And I think, I think we'll see an uptake here too with, um, with prepaid in that channel as well. And right now, I think what we've seen with prepaid and, and virtual is, is this real-time pay for, for gig workers, that's your Uber mm -hmm. drivers, your taxi drivers, uh, and things like that. And I think, I think that will continue to grow as well as we move forward. Absolutely. Yeah, I, one of the areas that the CPPO we've been quite involved in since the pandemic started is really trying to add government uh, benefit payments and particularly the emergency relief payments onto prepaid cards. So, you know, everyone thinks Canadians are banked and that is true to a large extent, but there still is um, an estimated 10% of the population that is under is truly underserved. Either bank accounts are still out of reach in terms of the costs or they live in remote communities that they can't get access to it, you know, et cetera. And um, as uh, if folks on the, the call today don't know the receiver general has actually finally put out an RFI for alternative payment methods including prepaid to be able to deliver uh, all um, and that would include tax you know relief uh, you know pay payments of all sorts um, we're quite behind the rest of the world here like everywhere in this um, in this sense and there's still you know millions of unclaimed checks every year that just sit out there that are sent by the Canadian government so for every reason under the sun that we all know as payments professionals we need to get this into the into to the mix. Um, and I loved hearing you talk about, you know, student cards. There's a new, um, there's some new fintechs, a company called Treasure that's doing this for students and, and kids. Greenlight in the United States um, is apparently coming up to Canada. So we have pay fairs doing gig work. So we have a lot of like really cool, innovative um, fintech companies, homegrown in Canada, doing a lot of the things that you, um, you're, you're talking about there. Jennifer, maybe if I can just add a, a thought there and, Please. you know, 
it's interesting because what you're really talking about at the end of the day is, is how do you move money um, into the into the hands virtually of someone who can then spend it, right? And and there's this clunkiness of trying to move move through the banking system, get it onto a card or a virtual uh, facsimile. And so it's the the successful solutions I think are really going to be the ones that that move beyond that that clunkiness and make it make it seamless. So I think you know it's quite possible. I think Canada is very highly banked, but, but with a lot of kids getting cell phones these days and stuff like that, like you could see the number of, of cell phone users potentially like eclipse banking, <laughs> bank account holders uh, at some point. Um, and, you know, we've, we, we had a big push last year to move people on to direct deposit, to get people off of government checks, working with the financial institutions and, and CRA. But even though we moved about like close to 3 million people, off of paper payments, there's still a really sticky and uh, like minority of, of Canadians that need better solutions around around having that money move through the move through the banking system into something that's that's easy for them to spend, and especially if they're not connected directly to that that banking Absolutely. system. So. Absolutely. I, I think I'm going to add something on that too, just a little bit of devil's advocate, which I think we have an opportunity in Canada to take a step forward. But if I look across the U.S. market, there is 21 billion. Uh, technically cash sitting in prepaid cards that are unclaimed, which averages at about $167 per household. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, the, the expiry dates, uh, lack of clarity, all of these elements on how we educate people of how much money they have on those cards. I think that's centralization to be able to trade cards. I mean, I think today you can probably trade in a Starbucks card for like a 30% discount, but those sites are hard to find. I think that you know, turning prepaid into a really kind of more floating currency is a real opportunity for us right. to take a step ahead there. And, and yeah. one of the things that, just to add to what you said, I think the issuers also need to reimagine uh, the business model to generate revenue and to provide flexibility to these corporates, right? Just to add to that was uh, loading of the car today, uh, you know, either it's through a bank transfer, uh, or through, uh, or through uh, uh, you know, going and depositing the cash in the bank. And I think that is where the innovation also needs to happen, where, uh, you know, the load can happen instantly. There should be an open banking framework to have an instant uh, load into the, into the prepaid account. Uh, maybe a check, remote check deposit that can be introduced to load the currency directly into, into your account as well. So I think, I think that is where I think uh, the key element of innovation also stands from a challenge perspective. And, and just, you know, to build on that, yes, I think where I get really excited is these things are now becoming much more mainstream. We've seen partners like Apple launch in the U.S., the Apple card, Samsung, right on their heels, Grab in Southeast Asia, Neil Financial up in Canada, where now, you know, that competitive pressure is building. It's no longer these niche virtual cards, their entire card programs backed by very large brands that are built specifically to, to that use case. So, I'm hopeful that in many ways this will rock the industry to kind of uh, also try to innovate and, and match what we're seeing uh, come into market. Yeah, makes sense. And I think on that step also is thinking on future currency. We've certainly been looking at a number of fintechs in uh, prepaid around Bitcoin, uh, that ability to look at a universal uh, payment opportunity, take away the exchange rates, et cetera. Um, that's another area that I think Canada can you know, take a step forward to. I, I look to see those discussions happening from a regulatory perspective. Yeah. So speaking of the regulatory perspective, let's talk, let's talk about that for a second, because as we know, um, you know, innovation can, uh, can certainly get us far. And as um, Jose was just saying, you know, the more we have consumer demand and, you know, folks innovating in market and people seeing Canada as a tremendous market to innovate in and, and bring in, you know, additional new innovative financial services. Uh, but let's talk about the, the regulatory challenges we are facing and how kind of the Canadian government's coming along with the open banking consultations, payment modernization, et cetera. So Brendan, let's put you on a spot on the spot for a second. Tell us, you know, Everybody knows what we're doing, okay? Everybody know, probably knows approximately, you know, the official line on where we're at in the process. But why don't you give us a bit of a sense for where you think we truly are at and, and where we're going and how as the industry, we can, we can help move these conversations along. Sure, sounds good. Um, and maybe just for, for, I know we have some international guests joining us as well in this webinar. So 
Let me just do a, a quick level set around a couple things and, and then talk about where we're at. So, so obviously there are a few building blocks that you need within a regulatory framework to make innovation really work. And, and um, Canada has this bifurcation between like the federal government, what they can do with banking legislation and, and payment system oversight. And you have a lot of the stuff in the provincial governments with, with contract law and, and market conduct. And, and a lot of the prepaid space is captured in at the provincial level right now. And, and so it's a bit of a, a challenge to navigate at times, I would think for some countries or companies that wanna operate across the country. Uh, the federal government, they've been, they've been promising for, for a couple of years that they're, they're ready with legislation to come in with a new national framework for retail payments oversight. It's gonna drive uh, more standardization and effective oversight for across the country. Uh, but we're still waiting on that legislation. And, and um, if you look at, you know, even, even Minister Freeland's mandate letter that she just uh, received a few days ago, uh, retail payments oversight is not in there as, as a priority for the government. And so, so we're, we're sort of uh, hopeful that we're going to see progress in this. It's not to say it's not going to happen this year, but, but whether you, I don't think you're going to see a big political push um, publicly. On the other side of things, you you know, open banking is a key enabler to to provide a framework for for people to engage uh, a lot more safely and effectively with third party service providers, uh, have more control around their data, and and for Canada, you know, we've we we the federal governments have this digital charter out in out in the public for for a few years now, and the banking sector is where they're really trying to drive um, some some concrete rules and requirements around how we're going to make consumer data rights work. Uh, there's a uh, uh, advisory committee that's issuing their final report into the finance minister on how to make that happen. What is actually gonna, how should we implement this? And, and they've just wrapped up a number of stakeholder consultations just at the workshops at the end of the year where, where you know, we were talking about uh, uh, data, what should be scoped into this, this regime? How do, you, how do you ensure effective um, uh, oversight and accreditation for the service providers that are going to be involved. How do you how do you drive this forward effectively, knowing that oftentimes legislation and regulation can take years to bring into force? How do you how do you keep up momentum, especially using energy in the private sector to uh, to move that forward? And so, what we're hearing is that uh, the the advisory committee they're going to be submitting their final report. Uh, this winter into the minister, and and then it's a matter really of seeing okay how much how much in interest and and energy do does the federal government have to to move this move this forward uh, in the current mandate? Uh, again, open banking is not something that's that showed up in in Minister Freeland's priorities uh, as as laid out by the prime minister, um, but uh, I'm hopeful at least that there's a there's been a pretty significant groundswell. Of, of support and interest in the in the in the financial sector to see this happen, uh, but you really need someone to pull it together. You've got a lot of disparate um, parties with different competitive interests at the end of the day, and so we need uh, we need um, to see if there's some some leadership from the federal government to to sort of name a name someone to push this forward. Um, I like, I like your point on that. I, I just want to add something about that. You know, when we look at kind of the UK as a model for open banking. Uh, and where they are at it, on it from a deployment side. I think a really important element is that only 25% of the public had even heard of that term. And that's almost uh, after first year of open banking moving forward. And only 20% actually knew what it meant, which actually means only 5% of the UK public even knew what open banking was about. I don't know whose responsibility it's size, uh, you know, whether it's on you know, fintechs, potential vendors, whether it's on... Uh, different agencies on educating the Canadian public about what open banking is, but I don't feel that swell and I feel someone's missing that opportunity in order to have influence uh, in the government because they're certainly not seen as a priority. So I think that that is an area that really needs uh, focus on, on our behalf, the collective, I guess, financial and fintech community who definitely see the benefits for end consumers for open banking. Yeah, Elizabeth, that's, that's a fabulous point. It's actually, I think the, the advisory task force, of the federal government, they tried to rebrand it as consumer directed finance to try to make it a little more relatable uh, to people. And I'm not sure whether that, I don't think that name is stuck, but they did recognize it. First off, people really don't know what it is. They sort of think, oh, my, my banking data is just going to be out in the open. 
Um, but once people actually think about the concrete use cases, that's when they that's when they love it. And and so really, there is some some real potential for for leadership and and um, engagement in the private sector to to drive that kind of understanding. I think Brendan, just to add to what you said, uh, you know, I would probably look at it as a as a three step, uh, you know, Lego building block, and probably resonating based on what I've seen happening in different geographies in the world. Uh, so obviously, the the first building block is the real time real, and the second one is open banking. Uh, but we should also kind of look at uh, the digital identity, which uh, continues to be, uh, you know, pioneer in terms of uh, you know card issuance and payment ecosystem. Uh, I think these are the three critical pillars uh, that would simplify uh, the ecosystem in payments in Canada. So I think yeah. just to add to what he said, you know, I would also add the, the digital identity into that equation. Yeah, that's that's a fabulous point, and actually something I was going to mention because I think really to help help make this happen, to have people able to operate securely and and maintain a certain amount of privacy online, digital ID is is essential. And you know, it's been ten years since. Within Canada, we've had DIAC, uh, the Digital ID and Authentication Council of Canada running, and various initiatives at Standards Council of Canada and elsewhere. But um, we still haven't really seen a, 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 a unified push or something that, that's moving the market. Uh, there are some private sector solutions out there for sure that the banks are supporting. And so it's, it's something that's got to come to age um, uh, pretty, pretty soon to make this happen. And then for our part with Payments Canada, I think another, another key thing is you know, how do we have the, the utility infrastructure set up with the right rules and capabilities to support the innovative business models? And, and for us, uh, with bringing in a, a new real-time payment system, uh, like what India has done and, and others, uh, we're looking at, you know, what capabilities and rules need to be there to support third-party payments initiation, uh, moving money through faster, making sure there's finality on those payments and, and the information flows with the payment. So that they can, uh, that you can, really be able to support um, faster, more innovative, uh, user-friendly um, business offerings. At the end of the day, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple uh, questions here, sort of on operational issues, and then I want to get to our discussion on fraud because we also have a number of questions that have come through on this. Um, and uh, just a reminder to folks, go ahead and send more questions into the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, you know, one question is around the Interact platform. I, the concern here is that, well, the suggestion is that prepaid cards are challenged, or it's a challenge to load them. Um, and that if there was a, I guess, a more ubiquitous platform. Um, so I don't know, Jayesh, if you have any thoughts on that or um, perhaps no, Jose on any changes that may be coming, go ahead. Oh, absolutely. I think I think one of the biggest uh, challenge in adopting prepaid is, is is absolutely how difficult is it today to load those cards. I mean, either you have to go to a branch uh, to load those cards, or you need to do a bank transfer, and, and it takes time when you do when you do a bank transfer uh, into the account. So I think some of the innovations that are already happening uh, are instant load of prepaid cards, and, and the issuer has to play uh, into this by doing some escrow account for doing that instant uh, bank transfer or account transfer. Um, there's, there are a few other use cases that I can think of uh, are users can go to an ATM, deposit cash and load uh, a prepaid card for somebody or, or for, for, for their own cards as well. Uh, check deposit, you know, we have already seen that happen into our checking accounts. Uh, you know, if, if that can be, you know, through, you know, digital identity and through AML processes, if that can be proofed out, I think check deposit also has a huge play into prepaid where you can take an image of the check, maybe the government subsidized check and load it directly into your prepaid card. So I think that is where I think the ease of loading the card uh, you know, plays uh, into prepaid going forward. Yeah, there's also the Canada Post option. I know that, um, yeah. I don't know if it's every Canada Post, but most around, um, around the country. Um, and then just one other uh, quick one here. Do you think consumers are reluctant to use virtual cards? Um, do we do we see that? Do we see a reluctance or a concern? Or I I think I, I can take that. Uh, you know I have actually seen this pattern where uh, the value prop of prepaid card uh, is not being communicated communicated to uh, the users today. Uh, I mean people are still of the opinion uh, that if I have a plastic in my hand, it's much more secure. But I do believe that the virtual card is way too secure than. 
uh, the physical plastic in hands. I think I think the value prop and, and, and the education about how secure those elements could be on your devices uh, needs to be put it out. Uh, and that I think uh, you know lies with the issuer in terms of how they communicate that message to the end users. Yeah, and I, th I think I think some of that reluctance will change when um, banks start to issue their own virtual cards. You know, you, you open an account right now and you're waiting 10 days to actually use that account because you're waiting for a piece of plastic to come through um, through the door. So I think I think when they realize their virtual card can help them with that, uh, that'll that'll drive some. And then, you know, you know, millennials are really good at uh, protecting the planet. And you think I, I heard a start, I think the 65 billion pieces of payment plastic out in the world where does all that go to right so i think i think that that drive from from millennials to protect our planet i think that we'll see an uptake in these digital payment methods too right. and i'll throw okay. in a, an interesting anecdote out yeah. there one of the more popular uh digital first cards that we see out of southeast asia issued by grab has a very simple marketing slogan what you can't see you can't steal uh, and they've gone out with that mass market and is, it has resonated really well. So increasingly, you'll see that type of messaging get out there, hopefully by more and more issuers and, and help drive that. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, let's think... uh, switch our... Oh, I'm sorry, did I speak over somebody? No, no, that's fine. I was just gonna make a comment on the virtual cards, but uh, let's, uh, in essence of time, let's move forward, sorry. Okay, no worries. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Okay, let's talk about fraud. Let's, let's change to fraud for a second. So uh, we've got a number of questions around, around this issue, but I'd love to start by just um, putting us in sort of the reality of digital payment fraud. And I think Jose, you had sort of a couple stats for us about like what really we're looking at here. Yeah, so when it comes to digital payments, the, the reality it is that, that fraud tends to be around three times the rate that we see in, in brick and mortar on digital. The, there is a saying within the fraud community, which is fraud never leaves the system. It finds the weakest link. And, and for many, many years, the weakest link has been digital payments and e-commerce. We standardized a lot of brick and mortar payments through Yamvico, through chip and pin, and through a lot of different mechanisms. Uh, but e-commerce has been kind of very piecemeal. And so we saw that before the pandemic, we saw it after. Hackers look for the weakest link uh, and that was often uh, digital commerce. And so we would see two and a half, three, even in some categories, about three and a half times the, the type of fraud rates um, that we would see in, in, in normal channels, if you will. I think kind of the good news, despite the fact that we as, a, as an industry have this problem is that there's finally been a shift into how we're addressing it. Certainly there's no silver bullet for this. There's a lot of different tools and solutions. Um, but what I, where I get really excited is that now, similar to what we've done in the physical space, working with the Ambico as an industry, you see networks, you see issuers coming together to have standards around tokenization so that we can once and for all remove 16 digit card numbers from digital flows altogether. There's no need for them. We can replace them with encrypted data packets uh, called tokens, similar like Apple Pay and Google Pay, and use those to transact. You see the industry coming together around 3DS, so authentication protocols that allow uh, transactions to be stepped up so that you as a user can get an SMS or an email if a transaction doesn't look like it might be very safe and you step it up that way. Um, and we also see finally standardization around guest checkout. Again, through EMVCO, uh, they've introduced secure remote commerce, works with uh, every major network. Um, so that's where I get excited. There's no silver bullet. This is an ongoing problem that we've had, we will continue to have, but the industry finally is seemingly uh, standardizing and coming together to introduce tools and solutions that can that can help in particular use cases. Thanks, Jose. We do have kind of a specific question here. Are virtual cards covered in the same way as physical cards from theft? So in terms of, um, you know, by the network and by the the FI, Jayesh, I don't know if you want to address that one. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, they are exactly identical to how you have your physical plastic. Uh, however, there are a few benefits of getting a virtual card. Uh, you might be able to get uh, a wave off on the issuance fees. Uh, the fees probably would differ. There might be no monthly fees or annual fees or transaction fees when you go with virtual prepaid cards or virtual uh, you know, debit cards. So I think that is where I think uh, the difference would be. But from a security perspective or from issue perspective, they basically are much more secure than a physical plastic. Okay. Um, we've got a question about chargebacks um, in terms of back offices being negatively impacted by chargebacks. 
um, for B2B payments, particularly in the travel agent, the travel industry. Um, Jeremy, I don't, is this one that you could maybe answer for us? Yeah, the, I think there's there's always challenges with chargebacks. It's a complex process. I, I, you look mm -hmm. at you look at chargeback manuals from uh, the networks, and they're, they're, they're like four or five hundred pages long, with hundreds and hundreds of different codes that you can apply to. So, so a, a chargeback expert is not somebody you can just pay cheaply. They, they they come at an expense, and and having proper process in place really really works. out. this is not something that you can do off the side of your desk. This is something that you that you need really deep um deep process to, to ensure that that it's done properly it, it's a set timeline it, it's set processes it, it, it's a difficult channel and i think i think as we move forward i think as we as we start looking at digitization i think i think creating a digital environment for the chargeback process will really help us right now it's 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 analog it's paper pushing and, and it's things like that so if we can if we can move into a digital environment to do that and create this uh, seamless approach i think that will really help that that, that back office issue okay uh, let's move on to talk about aml for a second so any money laundering um for those of us uh visiting internationally we have a, a couple of questions here so let me kind of throw out the themes that i'm i'm hearing from from folks so we've got a question a couple of questions on yes some prepaid cards have a maximum balance limit but you could go out and purchase a ton of these so how do you deal with that from an aml perspective and then two what are the chances of gift cards getting misused, misused illegally since there's sort of minimal or no KYC on those, know your customer? Um, that would just be for low dollar limit, um, anonymous, um, you know, open loop prepaid cards. So um, Jeremy, why don't I kind of throw these to you? Why don't you walk us through a little bit of your thoughts on, on AML and, and how Maybe let's also um, let's let's kind of attack some of the misnomers I think about prepaid and AML, and then also what really are the risks and how to address them. Yeah, I think you know I think there's 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 quite a few uh, misnomers here in relation to prepaid. Certainly, certainly uh, recently, prepaid had a bad reputation five, six, ten years ago in relation to money laundering and being able to to move uh, money quickly and easily across borders on a, on a piece of plastic seemed to be an ideal solution. And I think um, Canadian government recognized this. And then in 2019, they pulled out some regulations. And, and, and right now, a prepaid card, um, openly prepaid card is no different than a, than a credit or debit card in relation to regulations. It's, it's you, to, to get a prepaid card right now, you're looking at enhanced record keeping requirements, you're looking at enhanced due diligence, you're looking at um, special record keeping requirements for foreign virtual and suspicious tractions. It's been identified by the government that there was a weak area. 2019 saw a change to that, and now it's locked down. And I think I think um, there's there's risk with every card that you carry. I mean, the credit card right now, you can you can you can go into positive balance on a credit card too. That's it's no different. So it's it's about the the institution that has control over these cards coming together and making sure that their processes are, are right and in place and adhering to the regulations that are out there. Just to add to what uh, Jeremy said is, I think digital EKYC uh, will definitely play an important role in this space. I think uh, the issuers will probably have to look at uh, how they can enable that. Uh, the open banking framework uh, potentially could allow uh, these issuers and fintechs to kind of pick bank on the digital EKYC to kind of uh, uh, you know, perform due diligence on these cards to prevent, uh, you know, multiple cards being issued to one user as well. These are typically low dollar value cards that are issued, like gift cards, yes, but there's a prepaid card for uh, $50 or $100, someone can go and purchase thousands of them. So I think EKYC will help to monitor that. There needs to be some kind of uh, fraud-based monitoring, velocity monitoring to track, you know, how many cards in the has been issued out to, to an individual that will help to kind of prevent this uh, kind of activities in the future. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I, I, you know, if you look at legacy fraud systems that are out there, the the, the two that, that operate mostly are rule based or neural based. And I think, I think today, right now, we've got to move forward in relation to that and have some machine learning capability that goes all, along with that to really drive out and identify the trends that that, that are out there that just simply aren't picked up by having. Uh, analysts do this work you know, or it's much quicker than having analysts do this work right so a machine learning capability in that channel is essential 
Thank you. Okay, we've got a couple more questions, a couple more topics that have come up in the questions here, and I'd love to end by going through a little bit of a round robin on trends you all think is gonna be really important this year. Um, and Jose, we've had a couple on tokenization, so let me throw that over to you because I know that's a big part of what you're doing. So we have a participant in India who, um, has uh, given us the example how um, virtual cards, token, tokenized virtual cards can be used at point of sale at brick and mortar shops in India. There is a cap on it, but users can increase or decrease the limit on the fly based on the need. Is there any work in progress uh, on this in Canada or do you see you know, regulatory or other challenges being able to do something like this? Yeah, I think the good news is, you know, you know, one of the positives that came out of the pandemic here in Canada is that the industry coalesced very quickly to increase contactless limits. So in the same way, uh, uh, debit, credit and prepaid cards can be tokenized and added to wallets. We previously had a, a cap on about $100, so exactly $100 for contactless limits. There was some variation, some issuers and merchants had changed the rules and taken that liability on. But for the most part, there was a $100 cap uh, here in Canada. As of April 2nd of last year, we increased that to $250. And I believe that might actually be a, a, a world leader in terms of the highest contact list limit. I, I think it is. Yeah, I think we talked about yeah. that at another conference. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, so the good news is, you know, we've raised that limit. So now they can be used for $250. And even beyond that, it's not really that we set a contact list limit per se. We set something called a CVM, cardholder verification method. All that would happen is that if a user wanted to use that over 250 and the issuer hadn't changed the rules to make that happen, he or she would be prompted for a pin, which of course you could still have on a prepaid card. So there's definitely ways around it, but to be honest, we see a lot of the, the brick and mortar transactions under that 250 mark. Um, so I think just the fact that that contactless limit in Canada is now a world leader in 250 uh, should help solve for, for that within the mobile wallet context as well. Okay, great. Okay, um, we have got just a couple specific, um, you know, questions here. Let me just ask one or two, and then we'll go on to sort of our final roundup. Um, here's a question to you, Jayesh. In Canada, can you have virtual bank routing numbers slash account numbers to allow loads? Uh, this is respect to salary loads and bank transfers. So the answer to that is yes, unless I'm misreading well, that. Yeah. Okay, so. Yep, got that. And then, oh, also, we had a great addition from one of our participants uh, just back in our discussion on loads. So um, they've recommended third party wallet retailers can also be an option to load prepaid cards, right? So phone pay, Google pay and merchants. So thank you so much for adding that Thanks. to our discussion. Um, that's great. Okay, uh, we've only got a few minutes left. So I'd really like to go around the room to all of our, our panelists um, and ask you what you think sort of the big trends to bet on for next year in prepaid or card issuing in general. Um, we have had a couple of folks ask like, you know, what are really the trends? What are the new revenue streams? So if you can kind of keep that in mind, if everybody could give us just a short answer with one or two uh, trends you think are, are the best, that would be great. Um, Elizabeth, let's start with you. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Elizabeth. Oh, sorry, uh, where I think uh, really uh, two to three trends. First of all, I'm a big believer in that secondary market for closed loop cards. I think that there's a real opportunity in order to put literally, if I look in the US and you know that 21 billion in circulation, millennials apparently have accrued almost uh, 250 on average in terms of on these cards. So opportunity to engage there. The other thing is uh, I'm, I'm really big on when you're digital, you have a new set of data. I have not seen yet any level of better digital experience because of that data, whether it's my coffee with second cup in the morning, whether it's what I'm ordering with Amazon, nobody has been able to actually transcend that uh, element. So I think there's a big opportunity, what I call behavioral based AI. Um, also where I see is that, you know, from the, the retailer perspective is the ability to act more like a bank. I mean, we've seen steps of Western Union and the way that the transfer payments are using right now. We've seen Walmart who's basically saying, you know, we, we significantly deal with the underbank today. As we move to this digital world, how do we now create the kind of financial services that they need? So I think those are some of the big trends that I see. Excellent. Brendan. You stole all my good ideas. <laughs> you know, yeah, me too. I think um, 
For me, uh, I think two things, uh, gift cards uh, and prepaid as a gift uh, will be, I think, increasing, will be strong through this year. Uh, the, the more interesting thing for me maybe is, is around um, fintech and, and uh, financial institution tie-ups to, to offer prepaid card services and, and um, stuff that gets much more into that banking services end of things. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that we're seeing more and more of in Canada. Uh, and it seems to be operating, you know, within the regulatory framework that we have. Um, so I, I hesitate to call them challenger banks because they're not banks, but but they're really operating in that that more sort of core financial services side of things and, and serving a market that just isn't well well served by traditional institutions. So it's it's uh, it's cool to see. Great. So I'm hearing embedded finance, banking as a service, um, data and AI. Jayash, over to you. Uh, well, I'll be real quick. I think there are three uh, interesting trends that I see. Uh, international student prepaid card. So uh, students traveling, uh, you know, from outside Canada, coming to Canada for studying, I think a prepaid card definitely has a use case out there. Uh, An open loop transit card. Uh, I'm hearing something that there's already some work in progress on that front. Uh, and obviously the insurance fund disbursement that I believe would be a new trend in 2021, 2022. Thank you. Jeremy. Yeah, I, again, it's tough going towards the end of the group, right? So I think um, uh, it, international remittance payments over real-time uh, rails, I think that's that's got to come in. You, you, we can't be waiting five days for, for these payments to take place. And, and right now with, with things like Money Send and uh, Zoom services, these things are virtually instant. So, so I think that will continue to grow. I think a greater migration to digital payments in BTB, I think that's an essential piece too, um, because of what we've seen in the pandemic. Um, I also think virtual cards are really going to grow in, in banking in general. I think, you know, as I said before, with, with, with banks out there issuing you a piece of plastic um, it takes 10 days to get to your virtual card can get rid of that it can also it can also um, accelerate you again you, you travel away you lose your card happens regularly um, now you've got a virtual card that you can utilize in the meantime while uh, while they rush to get that card out to you I think that's but those are the things that we'll see going forward and Jose yeah I also had my thunderstorm by Brendan I was going to go with the fintech challenger bank route but in the interest of, of throwing something new out there, uh, I think what's going to be a big opportunity is disbursements for, for gig economy workers. Um, obviously, in Canada and across the world, uh, employment has become much more precarious over the last few months. Uh, and this is a trend that we were already seeing where, where so many Canadians were, were focusing on gig economy as a primary source of income. So the, the ability for these prepaid cards to allow for instant disbursements to your food delivery, to your Uber driver, to whomever it may be that needs that money right away uh, uh, to make ends meet. Uh, I think is going to be a, an even more important opportunity going forward. That's great. And I would just add one more um, government uh, benefit payments for that sort of last underbanked consumer that doesn't get caught up in the um, in the net of being you know truly banked in in Canada. So I'd like to thank um, all of our participants today. Thank you. That was an exceptional dialogue. Um, you're all incredible experts. Thank you to FSS and CPPO for um, co-hosting this today and FinTech Finance as well. And this uh, entire uh, video of our chat today will be made available on the FinTech Finance um, website and I'm sure you'll see us send it out in our social channels as well. So thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day and um, appreciate you joining us today.